Hey everybody, I am back in the garden today to teach you guys some basic garden troubleshooting at my mom's house in Tennessee. And some of you may not know, but we moved from San Diego to Tennessee about three years ago now. So if you've seen some of my older videos and some of my newer videos, it may not make total sense where I'm at now, but we are in Tennessee and we are gonna be troubleshooting this. So I wanna bring my mom in here. We're gonna go over fertilizing, you know, problems that she's having with some of her plants and how can we address all this? How can we train cucumbers? All that sort of stuff. So it's gonna be a real great beginner video today. So here's my mom that you Hello, might everybody. recognize. So how long have you been gardening? Well, I've been gardening for probably 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, more landscape gardening than mm -hmm. uh, food gardening. Um, but since we uh, came here about a year ago, um, I'm on a lake. I have a lot of hills with a lot of clay soil, uh, not a lot of level space. So wanted to grow food and decided that I would just do everything in pots or raised mm -hmm. beds. So mm -hmm. this garden here is really just a year old that's in this courtyard and um, I added some new beds this year. Mm -hmm. Now I know many of your gardens look something like this, so stay tuned, it'll be super helpful. And check out our other beginning gardener video that we did about three or four years ago. If you want all the rundown of all the basics of gardening, that is a great place to start. So check that video out in the description. And let's get started in my mom's garden today. So what is the first thing we should look at? Well, I've had a, num a number of problems and the first thing I, uh, I want to preface it with is right at the end of winter, very beginning of spring, um, I went ahead and got some seeds started. Mm -hmm. I got it a few plants started and then we took off in the height of spring for a five week road trip that was kind of came up on us spontaneously, but I wanted to get things in the ground, whether um, I could do a full spread, just a, a number of things in the ground. Then for the past almost, well, it was six weeks really in total, I had a wonderful, couple wonderful neighbors who kept things watered and kept an eye on everything, kept things alive. Um, but upon my return, I was overcome with weeds in every uh, <laughs> bed that you can imagine. The raised beds, however, not so, not so mm -hmm. bad at all, just a few here and there. So that's why I'm a big proponent of the raised garden beds for food. But all of my flower gardens, my um, you know, all different perennials and some of the annuals I planted were just, I had weeds three to four feet tall. <laughs> yeah. It was a mess. I weeds mean, grow tall in the <laughs> south. It's unbelievable. For sure. And so I literally, last week was the first week to attack it. I spent the entire week just weeding the most important areas that were closest to the house. And I had a couple beds that just pretty much died and we have no idea why. So I brought mm -hmm. Stephen in today to kind of troubleshoot with me maybe what went wrong, what we can do to kind of fix things or just do a replanting. Okay, so hopefully no one has a bed that looks like this in June. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> what I had planted in here were four tomatoes, um, mm -hmm. about four peppers, five peppers, excuse me, and some rosemary. And then around the perimeter, I did marigold seed, which had all sprouted and were, you know, just a, a couple inches tall when I left. As you can see, Everything has yellowed, the tomatoes have died, but even in their death, this one over here produced a piece of fruit. It's crazy. <laughs> and so did this pathetic looking thing right here. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure it was a mixture of um, Home Depot organic Kellogg soil and also mushroom compost. And I know that they got watered, but I'm not sure what happened. Do you have any yeah. ideas? So what I'm seeing here, you know, a lot of times when you have problems with your plants, you know, you post a picture online and someone will say, oh, it's a nitrogen deficiency because the leaves are yellow. Maybe. Uh, can, there's, a million, there's a bunch of reasons why ye leaves might be yellowing. So don't just assume it's nitrogen deficiency. So she had the Kellogg's raised bed and the mushroom compost. That should have enough nitrogen to make these leaves green. So, I'm suspecting possibly a fungal thing happened. Typically, that's what I'll see happen um, on uh, when you see tomatoes dried up and, and shriveled like this. And if I look closer at these leaves, I see a bunch of black splotches and stuff. That is a fungal outbreak. So that's more of my guess, probably of what went on here um, in this bed. Where did the fungal bad stuff come from? Who knows, could have blown in from other things. It could have been from maybe the mushroom compost. One thing to caution you about with mushroom compost that I and many other growers have experienced is herbicide residue. 
Um, if you're not familiar how mushrooms are grown indoors, typically a lot of these mushrooms are grown in sterilized straw and plastic. Where are they getting this straw? They're using the cheapest straw they can. The cheapest straw they can is sprayed with herbicide. Um, you'll see the results of that on your nightshades typically. So on your tomatoes, your potatoes, I will show an image here of what that looks like. The leaves will just be shriveled. Uh, it just totally messes up the plant. So um, I'm not saying that there's herbicide damage here. I'm not really actually seeing that stuff. To me, this looks fungal. If you look at the, this leaf too, the way it's yellowing like that, the yellowing even on this rosemary. Now, this also could be from a nutrient deficiency too. I don't think it's wise to just drill down and be like, oh, it's magnesium and oh, it's nitrogen. I, that's a foolish way to think. It's a reductionist Western way to think. That's not how I teach farming. It's about a holistic approach to this. So. Looking at this bed, not knowing exactly what went on, what can we do to this? So we need good guys in here. We need good microbes. We need probiotics, right? We take that in for our gut. Well, the same thing is necessary for the soil. So if there's a fungal outbreak and there's no good guys here, they will run rampant and take over the whole bed. So we need good guys. Where can we get good guys? High quality made compost, which sourcing that you need to talk to the person you're buying your compost from and ask them how do they make it. If they come back with an answer like, oh, I don't know, I just get random stuff and I put it together and then we turn it. That guy doesn't know how to make compost. And unfortunately, most compost makers out there, the landscaping people, the, the city people that make compost, they have no idea how to make compost. Um, so look for a craft soil maker, that, if you can find them. That's really who you're looking for. Or watch my videos, I'll teach you how to be a craft soil maker. So, the big thing I would recommend for this is getting some bi really good biology in here. So the easiest way to do that was, is with JMS, Jadam Microbial Solution. You can learn how to make it in this book um, or many videos online. Um, but good quality made compost is a great inoculant of good guys. So if you can find that quality compost, get it in here, water it, spread those nutrient and microbes in the soil. Something else that can prevent plants from defending itself from bad stuff, or maybe the, it's, we can address the nutrient deficiency that we, it's very difficult to address that without sending this leaf to a lab. Give it full spectrum minerals. So that means azomite or some sort of rock dust, a glacial rock dust, uh, sea salt. Um, you can make diluted seawater. That is one of the best and cheapest minerals that you can make for your garden. 30 grams of salt per liter of water is the salinity of seawater. So you'll take that, right, your, your liter that you created, now dilute that one to 30, and then water that into your garden. That is the easiest and cheapest minerals that you could add other than buying a micronized rock dust and sprinkle that out with compost. Um, and then the third thing I'll recommend that we're gonna add is a fish hydrolysate or fish amino acid, which I sell on my website. That's the best form of fish because hydrolysate and FAA are cold processed using the entire fish so there's no uh, denaturing of the nutrients or breaking apart amino acid chains in a heated process and all of that. So those are the two fish, don't use a fish emulsion that doesn't use the entire uh, fish, they don't use the bones and it's a heated process. So don't buy fish emulsion, that's junk in comparison to hydrolysate. That will be your mega fertilizer, liquid fertilizer. Um, you can of course make things like this and, uh, but that's a whole nother conversation when you get more advanced in gardening. So what we don't have right now is our microbe source. So either Jadam Microbial Solution, which is just potatoes, water, sea salt, or another thing that you can do is called an extract. So if you have well, uh, high quality compost or worm castings, put that in a burlap sack or a mesh painter's net, something, run water through that soil and that brown liquid that comes out will be full of nutrients, humic acid, fulvic acid. Um, and the microbes that are pulled out through water. Take that and then just dilute it 50-50 and then just to make it last longer and then water that in. That's something that we could, my mom probably has that somewhere and we could do that to get some microbes and get some more nutrition in there. Okay, so what we're doing is, if you're paying attention to everything here, I'm, we're throwing the whole kitchen sink out of it, at it, um, but in small doses so that Whatever this plant needs, it can get access to it. Now, we are, these plants are dead. We're pulling these out and we're gonna replant them. We'll leave this rosemary since it's a perennial and watch what our techniques do to it and hopefully it can recover. These are annuals. They're dead. There's no way to recover this. It's better to start over. 
And you're gonna learn as you grow in gardening that a lot of times a diseased or damaged plant, it's better to rip that out and replace it. A lot of times a diseased plant like this, not only will it have a fungal problem, it'll have aphids, it'll have some other insect also trying to get at it. So the weaker the plant is, the, just like a human being, when we have weak health and our immune systems is lower, um, things can get into us and make us sick. And that's what we're, I believe that we're witnessing here. And that's how I would address an issue like that. Okay, so now we got her next bed over here, which also had some of the Kellogg's and some mushroom compost in here as well. And that was another variable that told me that probably what happened in that bed was some sort of fungal disease. Look how healthy everything looks here. Now she has a couple new transplants that we will plant. So this is a great way to grow stuff, guys. If you wanna grow, you know, these plants that vine like this, like a watermelon, cantaloupe, sweet potato, um, cucumbers even, you can grow those onto the ground or a trellis. Um, so going vertically in a yard where you don't have a lot of grow space is, is a way to grow so much more. And uh, you know, my mom could run this along the ground on these bricks. Maybe in Texas where you're going over 100, that wouldn't be a good idea. But if you're in the 90s, it um, shouldn't damage the plant running over the ground like this. Uh, so my mom could possibly do that. Now, when the watermelon is formed, I wouldn't want that just resting on the hot stone. So that I would put onto something like a, a pile of straw or a pile of leaves, something that's going to insulate it from the hot stone, because that I think would damage the fruit and you would lose it. Maybe someone in the comments can chime in who has tried growing vining over top of hot stone like this in the summer. So my mom's got some new transplants that we want to plant. Yesterday when we looked at these, they didn't have enough water. They were getting droopy, so we added water. They recovered, but the top of this tomato didn't fully recover, actually. And it looks like this part of it is going to die off. This leaf may die off. And the issue that she's going to have is that both of these leaders are almost dying off, except this one. If all the leaders were to die on a tomato, Basically, the plant would stop growing. It'll try to put off another sucker to create a new growth point to keep traveling upwards. But most of the time, when you mi mistakenly cut off all of the leaders, whatever flowers are set with tomatoes will grow tomatoes, and that's it, and the plant's done, it's gonna die. We'll watch this over the next day or two, but this is probably gonna die, so we should just cut this back to the sunleaf node here. Um, just to help it save energy. It's gonna try to recover this. It's gonna waste energy on this. We might as well just cut it back because it looks like it's gonna die. And this leader actually is looking not that droopy, like it's gonna survive and be okay. So this is what we'll focus on for the remainder of the tomato's growth that we wanna focus this on growing up, remaining healthy, and taking those suckers off. And check out this video if you'd like to learn how to find tomato suckers and never make another mistake again. Before we plant the tomato like this, guys, and, and on your more established tomatoes too, you need to be taking off these lower leaves. Helps to use clippers too, guys, because a lot of times when you try to pull off a leaf, you'll strip off some of the flesh of the stem, okay. which can uh, be a, a vector for disease or bugs to get into. So clipping them is always smarter. And you know, this is typical on the lower leaves. They, what happens is they'll start to die off and they'll even get some fungal stuff going on, which is what I'm seeing here. So whether it's fruit trees or annuals like this, the way that fungal issues typically spread, if not spread by an insect through their biting, uh, it's spread through rain. So these leaves that are on um, near the ground, they have fungal spores, the rain's hitting it, or it's hitting the, the soil where so fungal spores are, and then they're splashing up back onto this plant and then the, the fungal infection continues. So by removing these lower leaves here, we're helping the plant defend itself better and not have that issue. Okay, and then I'm gonna make my way up this plant, remove the suckers. Now you gotta go watch my video. I'm not gonna explain how to find suckers in this one, but let's get rid of that. And now what I've done is, rather than allowing the plant to try to recover to that top there, we're gonna say no, go over here focus on this central leader to send it upwards and completely heal the leader. Okay, so now this plant, look, all the leaves are healthy now. Now it's ready to plant. Okay, so let's just get these guys out of the ground and then we'll remove them from the garden area. I'm gonna pick up all these leaves. I'm gonna get all of this out of here. Now, the wisest thing to do would probably be not to plant that immediately right now because there's a potential that it could get infected but we are gonna give it all the nutrition, all the probiotics to help it that not happen. 
Okay, now if you're scared and you didn't want to plant immediately, uh, allow this bed to get sun for a week and don't water it and let the sun beat on it um, so it can kill off any fungal spores that are around here. But you just got to understand that this, these fungal things are around all the time and they're really attacking weak plants ultimately. And we don't know what happened with this garden, right? We weren't here for six weeks. We had neighbors watering it. Uh, maybe, there, maybe earlier on there could have been something that we could have done to address it, right? Maybe it had a nutritional deficiency which weakened the immune system of the plant which allowed for the fungal thing to happen if, and if we would have been here to feed it and do some different things, then this never would have happened, right? Or maybe this was overwatered. If something's overwatered, that can increase fungal outbreak, okay? So there's a lot of things that went on that we were, were out of our control and we were coming back to troubleshoot it and just try to understand what happened here. Okay, so there's just, there's no way to 100% know. So what we also have is a, our, one of the best fertilizers in the world, which is worm casting. So you can uh, raise worms on your own. It's extremely easy. I have a few videos on that. Uh, but if you just want to buy it, uh, my business partner, SD Microbes, which I sell all of his stuff on my website, makes Biovast vermicompost, which is a fungal-dominated vermicompost. And uh, yeah, the lab tests are incredible on it. Super microbial, fungal-rich. I'd recommend buying that from my site. You get 10% off my whole site if you use the code NATURE10. So what we're doing is pulling this guy out. And I'm sure you guys have seen a basic planting video, but you just want to lightly rub your hand around the outside and we're just unlocking the roots. What I like to do with the fruiting vegetables, the summer fruiting stuff, uh, so peppers, corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, stuff like that, eggplant, I recommend in the planting hole throwing down a nice fertilizer like a worm casting. Just a small handful. So on a tomato that's taller like this, we can actually plant it uh, a couple inches before that first leaf. And what that is gonna do is produce a bunch more root structure because all of the different uh, little hairs here will actually become roots. Um, another technique is to actually plant the tomato sideways and, you, and uh, bend it up like that on a trellis. That's another way to get those extra roots. Or you can just plant it at soil level and that will work great too. So don't feel like you have to do some special thing. Um, tomatoes grow incredibly easily. So, okay, I just put my worm castings in the hole, just a small handful, drop it in, close the hole up. And this is getting bigger. It's getting top, more top heavy. So tomato cages are typically used on a determinate variety, which means that it will set fruit in one major motion. You'll get all the fruit and then the plant dies. Uh, an indeterminate tomato is one like this that's vining and it'll, it'll grow until the first frost where it gets disease and dies. Um, so you can definitely use a tomato cage, but it won't be, you won't be able to grow the plant as long or as easily as if you have a taller trellis. So I'm just gonna like kind of prop some of the leaves up on the cage the best I can. Um, just trying to keep them away from the soil, right? So we don't spread that any possible disease that we know we believe we know what's in here. Okay, and then at the top here, we're gonna add another small handful of our fertilizer. And then we're gonna plant the rest of this out and then we're gonna come back and I'll show you how to do the liquid nutrients and all that as well. So stay tuned, but let's throw the rest of these in. So what do we need to do on this tomato, guys, before it goes in? All this leaf has to come off, right? So we're just gonna rip all of it off. Now we're going to come in, in, in the inside here, we're going to grab the suckers. And now the plant will not waste any energy. Now, I have experimented with taking off the first flowers, and I don't find that it's that beneficial, honestly. I've heard other farmers say to take them off, but I've tried both ways, and I honestly don't see that much of a difference. So you try it for yourself, you know. I like to tell people don't trust what other people say test it yourself and see if it actually works. Um, I think too many people take advice from others with, and just accept it as true when I have found over 12 years of being involved in agriculture that either the farmer, uh, either the, the farmer's in such a different context or climate that it doesn't apply to me, or they're just wrong uh, and they, they don't fully understand something. 
or fully understand the whole picture, and therefore they're addressing the problem incorrectly and giving you the wrong advice. Uh, so that's why whenever I'm talking about gardening stuff, I give you, try to give you guys the fullest picture I can in the shortest amount of time that I can. Everyone's got a short attention span nowadays, but uh, I want you guys to understand the plant, understand the soil, so that you actually don't need me as your teacher anymore and you can do this completely on your own with your own intuition and knowledge. So spacing on tomatoes in a situation like this, um, where you're not gonna be doing some advanced trellising, do 18 inches. You can space tomatoes up you know, 12 inches apart, but don't do that unless you're gonna be doing a trellis. And that's just gonna give a lot of light spacing, more airflow, all that's really important for tomatoes so that they don't get fungal problems. And in the south, I've noticed that um, almost no matter what you do, you're going to get a fungal problem. Your tomatoes aren't going to last till the end of the season. Like in San Diego, I was able to grow a tomato over a year through the winter and keep going. Um, but here, that's not as possible. So I'd recommend on all your, your plants that you notice dying out in the middle end of summer, that you, you do your first fruit planting um, after your first frost date, right? Like normal but plan your secondary transplants, um, your second planting, your succession planting to happen about four to six weeks after that. Plant another round of tomatoes, squash, the things that you notice dying out early in your garden or that get attacked by pests. And then you'll have a backup that will get you through the rest of the season. So in July, when all your tomatoes die out, which has been happening for me the last couple of years or by in August, they die. Um, I would have another month or two of good growth from these type of plants. So that's another really, really valuable tip that's really farmers are doing that, not regular gardeners. So, but that is the key to having a longer, more consistent harvest. And this is important to make money farming, but for people who would just want to grow their own food, it's, that's how you can have food as close to all season as possible. So another really simple thing you can do is a bamboo stake. You know, a taller one would be better, but this initially would support it for a little while. You can use a one by one stake and wrap it around that. Um, there's a lot of simple trellises out there that you can do. Just anything that will get it to go vertically and it's, and it's gonna hold it in place. I love Cherokee purples. So I'm growing Cherokee, Cherokee purple here. This one is a sun sugar. Um, these plants were all purchased uh, from a Mennonite community near me, and they do all the starts, and I've purchased their uh, sun sugars before, and they're sweet as can be, and, uh, but I've never grown them. That's a cherry, right? This is a cherry, mm -hmm. right? And then the other one that we have here is just your basic large cherry. There's really not a definitive name on it oh, of what yeah. variety, but it's a And then this is a generic. slicing beefsteak or something, And that's something, a slicing right? beefsteak, yeah, nice. but it's the purple Cherokee, which is really rich flavor. Mm -hmm. This is what they call Mama, Mama Mia Galealo. <laughs> is that like an Italian <laughs> Mama sweet Mia. pepper? Yeah, Must Mama be. Mia pepper. Uh, it's a s sweeter pepper. I kind of like the sweet peppers because yeah. I use them more mm -hmm. consistently mm -hmm. in a lot of cooking dishes. And then, so look yeah. at this plant, guys. See yellowing leaves? If I see that, I just get rid of it because this, can this photosynthesize? No, it, it's on its way to dying and, and just, just get it off of there so the plant doesn't have to worry about it anymore. You know, these are your lowest, most ugliest looking leaves that I'm talking about here. And what about on a pepper with these low ones? Do they come these off too? These low ones, I take it off. Okay. Now there's a lot of people that'll prune a pepper. They'll top it actually um, to make it produce more growth points. I'd recommend as a, as a gardener, you tr experiment with that and see what you like. Now I can't, I get, I grow so many peppers on, you know, 10 plants. I can't keep up with it anyways. So trying to make them grow more, it's just, more of my time to deal with pruning them. So I don't prune peppers personally, um, but if you want to get a lot more growth and, and stuff like that, pruning them can be a really effective way of getting more fruit on a single plant. So these leaves on the ground that are touching the ground like this, I don't like that. So, and they're already yellowed. So I'm actually just going to pull these off. We can just give them a small stake for now. And he can kind of lean on there. Peppers are pretty self-supportive until, like, except maybe for uh, bell peppers. They're so heavy that bell peppers really need a support. A lot of the smaller peppers, the hot peppers like jalapenos and that sort of thing, uh, I never support, end up supporting those uh, because they kind of just lean on each other. Okay, so we're going to throw a basil in the center here and just kind of tell you guys about a little bit about interplanting and just some uh, 
benefits to that. So putting this in the center here, this will eventually produce flowers, which will bring in more pollinators. The smell of basil and other herbs uh, can be a detractor to bugs and more diversity uh, amongst your garden is just going to help for a more overall healthier soil and healthier just plants in general. Um, now on a small scale like this, you can do monoculture stuff in a bed and it's not a big deal. As long as you have other flowers and other herbs around your area, you're still gonna get some of that pest resistance and pollinator effect. And it also just looks really pretty in your garden and uh, growing tomatoes and basil together is the perfect combo, right? That's what we're gonna make our spaghetti sauce out of or other, other dishes. And uh, in my market garden, I actually stopped planting full beds of basil. I just planted my basil right under the tomatoes. And this is a really important concept to understand, which is layering vertical and horizontal space in a garden. How big does a basil plant get? Maybe like this tall, this big? How tall does a tomato plant get? Oh, it can go 15, 20 feet up. So it can get the sunlight up high, this plant gets the sunlight down low, and you're pruning that tomato down low. So now it's letting in all that light down to the basil, and now you're growing two plants, twice the volume of produce in the same bed. And this is how you profitably farm on a small scale, T techniques like this. But those techniques are amazing for growing a lot of food in a small space, and that's why uh, keep practicing those types of skills and looking at your plants and understanding, okay, the pepper's only going three feet. I can combine that with another plant that goes tall. Lettuce, radish, beets, these are all things that can go underneath plants that grow taller. Okay, Stephen, I have questions on my cucumbers here. So I grew cucumbers here last year. They did very well, but I really didn't think that I was really growing them pro properly. I let them kind of just go wild. And earlier, when you were looking at them too, you mentioned that I've got suckers going on. And I didn't even know that suckers were common with a cucumber. <laughs> so help me understand that a little bit better and what would be the uh, best way to get the biggest yield. So when we say sucker in gardening, we're, what we're talking about is a new growth point. The top of the plant that continues to go forward or upwards and putting off new sun leaves, male and female flowers. The female flower, once pollinated, becomes the fruit. You also have these little vines that like to attach on things. So at each node of this plant, and a node, I'm touching the node here, I'm touching the node here. This is the top. Here's another node here. It's in the crotch of the plant. A lot of people will describe it, right? So the sucker occurs at almost every node, you know, 90% of every node will have a sucker. And the sucker will produce another thing that looks just like this, a new growth point. What does a new growth point do? It puts off flowers and fruit. What if we had that happening at each one of these nodes where the sucker went out? The plant will be expending too much energy across its entire self that it can't produce high quality fruit. Does that make sense? Like if you didn't eat enough calories, could you put on a muscle if you're lifting weights? No. Um, and that's a similar-ish kind of concept, right? It can only pull up so much nutrition. It can only push out so much nutrition across its whole body. So by removing these suckers in plants like this, like a tomato or a cucumber, we're now forcing the plant to put all that energy into selected fruit rather than all the fruit, and you're just going to get tiny little crappy fruit. This is the same thing concept when you're pruning a grape, for instance. You don't want to let all hundred nodes of the plant shoot, put out shoots. No, we do that to get sweeter, better fruit. And, and uh, anyways, that's why we're doing this. So, so can you show me a few places where so, I have suckers happening? So when you, okay, so when you get up to a situation like this, when the plant is all over the place, I, you know, it's hard for me to determine, well, where the heck are all these suckers? So what we're going to do first, is find all these long growth points and just put them up on the trellis like this, okay? And we're also gonna look, where's the base of, the, where did this plant start and where is it coming out of? And we can follow those uh, to their growth points. So the plant's coming out right here. Here's another one. Here's one coming up here. This is another growth point. So let's just, we'll set this right here. <laughs> so wasn't it smart that we tried to pull it apart? Because look, we actually have two plants here and we didn't even know it. Okay, so we're gonna address these separately, right? So she's got a, a decent cucumber here that'll be ready in another day. 
And then it looks like the plant shot off two main growths, basically from the center here. Now we could have addressed that at the beginning of the plant's life. That didn't happen, that's okay. We can address it now. So a lot of times what I like to do with these plants, <clears throat> when they sent off all these growth points, you know, I, it's like, oh my gosh, I, this, this cucumber is pollinated, I can tell, because it's, it's not yellowed, it's green, and the flower's closed. Gosh, I would hate to lose that by clipping this all back. Rather than, than losing this fruit, I can clip it right there, and I'll still get that cucumber. Now look up higher. None of this is fertilized. It's going to take way too long. So let's just stop it at the last fruit and stop this growth point from continuing and on and wasting energy. Okay, because we have this growth point, we have this growth point, we have this growth point. Now the way she's, she's doing it, you know, I do everything single leader, whether it's my tomatoes or my cucumbers. Um, since she's already got this growth going, let's leave a couple of those growth points um, because she'll get more fruit, but we don't want to leave too many. You know, three max. And then you want to stay on top of the suckers so they don't put out any more. So in order for a cucumber to be made, a bee or a pollinator has to take the male flower. There's, you see how there's no fruit on that? That's a male ah, flower. Ah, so you're looking for the fruit. It yep. should be forming by now. Yeah, well, no, no, no. Or, it's a male flower because there's no fruit on the back end of that. Look at this flower here. This is a female flower, an unfertilized fruit behind it. Oh, so all of the females yes. produce fruit. Males do not produce no, fruit. No, no. Like so what has to happen, a bee has to, or a pollinator has to go into this male flower, get the pollen on that, and then it has to go inside of this flower, and then it will become pollinated and grow. If that doesn't happen, this will yellow and fall off. That happens for squash, it happens for every plant that gets pollination, it operates like this. Here's the new growth points. It's continuing on the very tip. We'll just cut it right there to that fruit and stop. Further on down the line here, here's another sucker. So watch my video on finding cucumber suckers and come back and then, you know, go through your plant. Each node has the potential to have one of these suckers. Now, on a really healthy cucumber plant, everyone will have a sucker. If it's not doing as well, it won't put off as many suckers. So I'm not finding as many here. This is such a strong, vigorous, healthy one. I don't really want to clip that. I'd rather just let it go. So we'll leave that one alone. What we're remaining with is one, two, three growth points that are going to continue on. And then we have a bunch of terminated sections that will just produce the fruit and stop. And then we're going to go through the rest of the plant and remove any other suckers that could waste our energy. Okay, and then we need to fertilize this heavily. So more worm castings and then we'll come in with our liquid nutrients, minerals and inoculants at the end and water that all in. Which is our healthiest, this is our healthiest growth point and coming off of it is a sucker. Are, is there any fruit? Nothing. So I'm going to come all the way back to the main vine and take that sucker out. Okay, gone. And now we'll focus all the energy onto this really healthy guy here. Now we also have two other sucker growth points here. I don't see anything healthy, oopsies. I don't see anything healthy on this one. I don't see any fertilized fruit. So I'd rather just take it all off. I don't want it to waste any more energy trying to okay. make good fruit. Okay, and then we have a final one here. Let's let this one go. Coming back here on the back of the plant, near the bottom, and uh, you're gonna wanna remove leaves. You can see there's some powdery mildew right there. So fungal issues are starting, right? The leaves that are closest to the ground are gonna get those fungal issues. So, you know, that's why there's an argument for trellising cucumbers, especially in a fungal environment like the south, because you're gonna limit your disease. So she'll leave two growth points here, three there, and now she can experiment with that, experience it, and then say, hey, next year, maybe I'll just do two growth points or one growth point, or I like doing three, that actually worked out really good. So uh, try different things when you're gardening, and that's gonna help you to increase your knowledge and just get better at it. So I've got 30 grams of salt and a liter of water. So that is gonna make, and if you were to taste this, you'll recognize it's very close to the salinity of the sea. So I'll just stir that and get it to all dissolve in there. Now this is too, way too salty to put on your garden. Don't do that. Now I need to dilute this one to 30. So we're gonna do 10 liters total volume. 10 liters is 10,000 milliliters. So I divide 10,000 milliliters divided by 30 
and that gives me 333 milliliters, which is a 1 to 30 dilution. So all I got to do is add 333 milliliters in this. Now to get the correct dilution, we got to add regular water up to 10 liters. And now this is 1 to 30 diluted seawater, which is an amazing mineral uh, supplement that you can add to your garden. And in terms of the salt that you want to buy, I'd recommend Redmond's Real Salt for your body, for your soil, for your animals. This is a Dead Sea salt source in Utah, so it's American owned, American mined, free of microplastics, no pollutants, because it's a Dead Sea, so it's way better than buying the Himalayan sea salt from Pakistan, which I don't trust whatever they're doing over there. I don't want to support the labor over there, the transportation across the ocean. We can get it right from Utah. It's amazing salt. So use that, guys. It's going to be way better mineral balance in that as well. And now we're going to add in our fish and kelp fertilizer. So kelp's full of all sorts of amazing nutrients and minerals. Fish is a just a broad spectrum fertilizer. For this, we need um, two tablespoons per gallon and 10 liters is about two and a half gallons or so. One more tablespoon there. So I did five tablespoons and 10 liters. Now I'm gonna show you guys real quick how to do a extract. So you can do this with compost. You can do this with vermicompost. I mean, you can of course do an aerated tea that's more complex. Let's not go there yet, you know? Now I've got an old pillowcase here. You could use a paint straining bag. You could use an old t-shirt. You could use any type of mesh. And I'll put in about, you know, a pound per gallon, let's just say, is a rough, a rough estimate here. You'll notice I don't do a lot of things by a formula. I have basic ratios in my head, and that's what I just do things by, and I don't really do things by a recipe. Um, so I try to give you guys some stuff here and there, but I'm looking for the microbes. I'm not looking for an incredible amount of true nutrition. We just got that nutrition in here already. And use unchlorinated water if you have access to it. So rainwater or uh, reverse osmosis water or water that you've let sit in a barrel for 24 hours or you've aerated. Chloramine is a concern, but we'll not, we won't get into that. Now, there's some filters you can buy too that will reduce chlorine. You guys might be able to see there's brown, kind of brownish water coming out. You can squeeze it a little bit, but you don't really have to do that. I'm trying to just get a little bit more out. So that brown water, what's in that brown water? Humic and fulvic acids, which are kind of the end stage of decomposition and the best you know, food for your plants, basically, and other uh, microbes. So then what you can do with this worm castings at the end, we'll just add it to the garden, or you can throw it in your compost pile um, and it will re-inoculate and it will be full of nutrients again um, after it sits in your compost pile for a while. I'm just gonna continue to do this until I reach my full dilution of 10 liters and then we can water it in. Now, if you just want the humic and fulvic acid only and, and to create your own, don't squeeze it like this, just passively um, run the water through it. Now, depending on how you're gonna water it in, I could have just thrown those castings in here raw, but if it's gonna come out small little holes, it'll plug the holes. Uh, so that's why it's better just to do that extract. Doing it this way is really easy and great and just takes all those microbes and certain elements and nutrients and puts them into water soluble form and then we water it directly in so um, that's why I really like the extract method and it just takes it's so easy you don't have to know about aeration and have all this extra equipment that costs more money this is so simple do you want to use this immediately you all everything's alive right now you don't want it to just sit in the water okay now down in this soil it's already extremely wet so I don't need to give it too much because the soil is so saturated um, these nutrients will be able to flow deeper down into the soil. Um, and if your, your bed was extremely dry or hydrophobic, which means it resists absorbing water, I actually would like, I would want to pre-water with, with just regular water to get the water soaked so that when you deliver these nutrients, it's actually able to go deeper and then be stored in the soil. Um, when, when soil is hydrophobic or really dry, um, a lot of times it can kind of just run off and sit at the top of the soil which isn't really where we want the nutrients and the microbes. We want them down in that root zone. Um, so if it's pre-moistened and then you put it in, it's gonna go down deeper. Or, you know, just keep in mind that if you were to do it on top of hydrophobic soil and then you water it in, 
it might take it too far and, and, and go beyond those, the root zones. So anyways, that's kind of like a strategy I use to uh, make sure it's, the nutrients are where I want them, right? So I'm just gonna add one, two, one, two, one, two. It looks like we're gonna get some rain in the forecast over the next week, so that will help to drive these nutrients down even deeper. Let's do one more little squirt. One, two, one, two. And we're gonna just wait for the rain because uh, that's another big gardening tip, guys. Watch your weather, learn to understand the weather and time things with the rain. A lot of times you can get away with not watering or you can save yourself from damaging your plants. Let's say it's, it's gonna rain an inch tomorrow and I didn't check the weather and I fully soak this bed. That's not a good idea. That's gonna really damage your garden and set it back because it's so waterlogged. The plants aren't gonna like that. If you guys enjoyed this video and learned a lot, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and the notification bell so you can see when all my videos come out.